Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. Um, I'm excited to have Shankari Chandra joining us today. Um, thanks, thank you for joining us. Oh, Jackie, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, Shankari was raised in Canberra, Australia. She spent a decade in London working as a lawyer in the social justice field, and she eventually returned home to Australia, where she now lives with her husband, four children, and their dog, Benji. She uses storytelling to interrogate injustice. As a lawyer, she, she specialises in law reform, program management and community development. As a writer, her work explores disposition, cultural erasure and connection. And her latest book is Chai Time in Cinnamon Gardens. Hopefully, oh, it's disappearing a bit, but there's my there copy is, there. There it is, I can see it. Yep. <laughs> and I um, just want to mention to people watching that thanks to Ultimo Press, if you ask a question during the Facebook Live, um, just type it in comments and you'll have a chance to win a copy of Chai Time in Cinnamon Gardens. And have to mention, I've just finished reading it this morning and really loved it. Like, um, just loved the different culture in it and that and, and the, the um, fact that I learned a lot of the culture from reading it and that as well and about historical um, events that have happened in the past as well. So thanks so much for joining us. Would you like to start off by telling us a little bit about Chai Time and, and Cinnamon Gardens? Sorry, Chai Time and Cinnamon Gardens. That's it, thank you so much for reading it, Jackie. Um, Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens is, um, it follows the lives of the residents and the staff at a nursing home um, in a fictional suburb in Western Sydney. And it's set against the rising racism of contemporary Australia, but it flashes back to um, the lives of the elderly residents and the staff decades before in their ancestral homeland of Sri Lanka, often during the Civil War. Um, the novel is about the stories that the staff and the residents tell each other and themselves to keep their memories and their culture um, alive. And it, it celebrates the way that we build communities when we leave our old homeland and come to a new homeland and the way that we hold on to our old community. And so it's really my love letter to storytelling, but it's also my love letter to Australia. Mm -hmm. And just wondering, would you like to maybe read a little bit of it to us? I would love to. Yeah. I'm going to read from the prologue, which just sort of sets up the scene of the nursing home. And I'm going to have to take my glasses off because I'm aging rapidly. <laughs> um, and I'll do this, so don't laugh at me, okay? Um, the Cinnamon Gardens nursing home sleeps deeply on this summer night. The heat trapped in its brick walls radiates outwards through the skin of its painted facade. It forms a gentle nimbus around the building. Arabian jasmine climbs the wooden trellises staked in the garden beds. They are bold travelers, dark vines carrying white stars up the two-story walls and around the windows of the residence. The plants grow obediently in the quiet suburb of West Grove, Sydney, but its tropical ancestors are a wilder breed, a vine that grows rampant in the villages of Sri Lanka a home more familiar to many of the residents. They remember this fragrance from their childhood and it creeps into their sleep, turning nightmares of war into dreams of their parents, long gone but still loved. To the passerby, the grand old Federation building has been restored to its colonial corpus. It looms over a circular driveway, wide enough for ambulances to speed in and for hearses to crawl out. The driveway curls around a small garden of giant agaves. In the moonlight, the succulents look like granite statues, spiky oversized sentinels that hide a sandstone plinth in the center. The plinth is empty. No statue sits astride it. Without a purpose, it has been forgotten by almost everyone. The southerly swells around the nursing home. The residents are used to a more feverish summer that rots the wooden bones and crumbles the clay muscle of their homes. But they welcome the southerly and breathe more easily when it slips through the mortar of cinnamon gardens and lifts the blanket of heat from their aging bodies. The wind, now reduced to a breeze, explores the nursing home as it has many nights before. 
while the outside of the building has been restored, the inside has been completely transformed. A few vestiges of its history remain. High ceilings with ornate bas-relief carvings here and elegant architraves there. But the inside of the building is functional, repurposed to hold and house a community of elderly men and women. The southerly passes the office and the industrial kitchen on the ground floor of the old building. In a few hours, the cooks will begin frying onions, curry leaves and green chilies for the breakfast omelette, served with idiopum sudi and sambal. Omelette on a bed of steamed rice noodles topped with milk gravy and a side of freshly grated coconut to tossed in chopped chili. It's something to wake up for. According to the wooden staircase on the second floor or to the second floor, eight residents, the longest serving, sleep and dream of the books they want to write, the battles they haven't finished, the lovers they didn't marry and the children they couldn't protect. Each resident has their own room along a corridor that leads to a, sh a large shrine room. Its altar was, is heavy with the gods of the Hindu pantheon, the main faith of the nursing home. But there are other statues too, representing both the Hindus hedging of divine bets and the religions of the rest of the community. The nursing home's previous owners built a shiny red brick monolith behind the old Federation one. Its four floors and ample girth cast a shadow across the elegant grounds. This wing is home to another 50 residents of Cinnamon Gardens. The two buildings are connected by a covered ramp on the ground floor, a tunnel with a gentle gradient for the wheelchairs and trolley beds. Maya, the nursing home's current owner and the resident of room one in the old building, renamed this new wing Sivam in honor of the God of Destruction. Shanti, Shanti Segram in room six asked Maya if she thought she was being funny. A wide garden stretches around these buildings. Over the four decades that Maya has run the nursing home, it has been terraformed from a neglected wilderness to orchards and large beds of, ve of vegetables that feed the residents. The crops are more comfortable in the red hard earth of Jaffna in northern Sri Lanka and the verdant flatlands of the Vanni jungle to its south. But Maya and her family have plowed and tilled and nurtured. They have coaxed and cajoled the earth of West Grove to yield manioc, vallara, murungakai and karavapale. At the very bottom of the garden, beyond the vegetables and Ayurvedic herbs and almost hidden by a row of black jamun trees, stands a house with only two bedrooms, a generous bookshelf and a kitchen that's more of a kitchenette. The house is small in stature, but the memories it holds are immense. It is rightly called the caretaker's cottage. The different people who have lived there over the last four decades have accepted that responsibility and burden with courage. Thanks so much for reading that. That's a great introduction Thank to your you. book. No, that was great. That Thank you, you for that. allowing me to do that. <laughs> I'm just wondering, what was the first idea you had for Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens? So Cinnamon Gardens is based on the real life nursing home that my grandmother lives in. Mm -hmm. And when we go to visit her, and, and it's a nursing home in Western Sydney, yeah. in um, an, in a neighborhood that's very multicultural, but also very Sri Lankan Tamil. Mm -hmm. And the nursing home itself has meant most of the residents now are Sri Lankan Tamil over the years. And when we go to visit her, um, you know, I would take my four children and we will you know, we'll sit with her and she'll tell us her stories and then we'll take her for a walk um, throughout the, the nursing home, up and down the, the sort of corridors and up the ramp and around the corners. And she will point out the residents of the different rooms as we're walking. Oh, okay, and these are all people yeah. she's known from back home. Yeah. And she'll tell me their secrets and their stories <laughs> and their scandals. And she'll tell me the things they've done wrong and the way that they've accused her of oh, stealing okay. their butter cake recipe and that their aubergine curry is not as good as my aubergine curry. And, you know, they didn't invite us to this wedding. And, you know, your grandfather mm. saved that person's life, but they were so ungrateful. <laughs> and these stories just keep coming. And my grandmother, when she tells a story, you know, about today, it usually starts five decades ago. Mm. And so, and then we'll go back to her room and because it is a very Sri Lankan nursing home we will run into our friends and our cousins and they're meeting mm. their amamas and appapas their grandmas and grandpas and so in any one room you'll have four generations of a family yeah. um, who are you know who are listening and learning and laughing and fighting and talking and I just thought 
what a tremendous place of community mm. and what a beautiful place to set a story. Yeah. And so it just, it went from there and then I couldn't stop Jackie. I just, mm. you know, there were ideas all around me and I couldn't get them down fast enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds great. And yeah, I can imagine what a wonderful community it must be. And to be able to also have people there who you knew from back home and that as well for people must be amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to grow old, I think. Mm. Um, and they, for many of them, their memories of the past are far more vivid than their memories of the present. Mm. And so when they talk to you, you know, the, the past is so alive for them. Um, and then it makes for, for very easy storytelling if you like to listen like yeah. me and you like to write like me. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got quite a few people watching, um, which is great. So just reminding people watching that if you do have any questions, Shankara, please um, type them in comments and I'll read them out and you'll have a chance to win a copy of Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens. So I have um, some people who have made some comments about the excerpt you, ran, you read. Um, so Kelly said that sounds like a great book. It really transports you there. Um, Jill says she loves your descriptive writing. And Sarah has said that she loves the use of all the plants that you described in the garden. And now it's made her want to go out and research them all and use some in her cooking. Mm -hmm. I oh, so good so good and uh, mm. and you know food and is such an important part of our culture and so I you know Jackie you'll you'll see it throughout the book right mm. um, yeah so, so much of our obsessions are mm. around showing people that we love them through food and and that's one of the ways in this nursing home that they love each other yeah is the, is the food they cook for each other mm. Mm. and I'm um, Sally so Kelly's wondering um, whether you develop the title yourself she said that she really Really loves the title. Thanks, Kelly. Do you know when I first I just had this kind of weird aha moment. I'm not very good at naming a book mm. or a manuscript when I'm working on it, but I always need to give it a working title. And with this particular manuscript, I had so many ideas and I had certain scenes in my mind. So the scene that there's a scene in the prayer room. So the nursing home has a prayer room with many deities, in particular Hindu gods. And mm. the, the elderly ladies and, and gentlemen come every Thursday for a special prayer and they often fight with each other over which, you know, what position the gods should be at in the altar. Oh, really? And it, it ends up resulting <laughs> in a particularly physical fight between the elderly, which does not end well for the deities. Um, and so, you know, I go on a Thursday morning and see my grandmother and the nurse and the wheelchairs are lined up mm. and they're all in their cardigans and caftans or their best saris, depending on who they are and how they want to assert their social hierarchy. And so I had all these ideas. Um, but what was the question again? My God, I've just totally forgotten. <laughs> the, my title. Oh, the title. The title. The title. The <laughs> title. So I had all these ideas and I had decided to apply for government funding for a grant mm, and mm. you need to give your project that you're applying for funding a title. Mm. And so I just had this kind of, oh, chai time at some others, that'll do. It sounds quirky and exotic and um, intriguing and, you know, full of whimsy and full of wit. Mm. And I thought that I would write, um, may, I thought maybe I'd write an eccentric novel set in a nursing home because often, you know, my grandmother and her friends can be quite eccentric in the way that we all are eccentric. Mm. But as Jackie will tell you later on, you know, you get sort of 10 pages into the novel and it explores some darker themes about yeah. life in Australia. Mm. And with the title, you know, my, I, I, when I found a publisher for it, my agent and I went to the publisher and said, look, the title is, you know, it's almost, for want of a better word, a little twee, right? It's Try Time at Simon Gardens. You think you're going to read a really happy novel and that's yeah, not to say you're about but, to read a yeah, tragedy, yeah. but it is a little misleading. Mm. And he really loved it. And where we landed on in the end was that the, it's almost like a Trojan horse. The title and the cover is so beautiful. And the yeah. artist who prepared that is so clever. And it's really um, beguiling. And you pick it up and I want you to think, oh, this is going to be really sweet. Mm -hmm. I really want to spend some time with these quirky characters. And then I want to hit you hard <laughs> with my Trojan horse. Yeah. So that by ten, page 10, you're like, oh, this was not what I was expected, but I still <laughs> am invested. I still want to be here and I still want to go on this journey with these characters. Mm. And you mentioned about the cover. Have you, do you want to hold your book up there? Have you got the cover? Of the... Oh, I will. I'll see if I can get into the, there we go. Yeah, there we go. So it is a beautiful cover. And you did, though, mention there is like some hidden 
um, secrets in there and um, some terrible things that happen. But I wonder, like up the very top of the cover, there's the little windows with the dark people in yeah there. I wonder if that's yep sort of the a shadows little bit of a hint to that there may be secrets coming. absolutely i mean this cover it's almost like a where's wally for the novel because Mm. Yeah, you there's look at so it and much. think right okay Yeah. there's Mm. so much going on right and i and my even my publishers said to me just last week he said every time i look at this cover i see something new that i've missed before um and so the artist who who created it she read the book she really understood and was observant she really saw all the little symbols and motifs that are throughout the novel and she's found a way to put them all in this beautiful cover so when you read it i want you to go back to the cover and have a look and then where's wally it see if you can find everything that's there Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jill wonders if you'd always wanted to be an author. ah oh, jill my god from the time i could read i wanted to write Yeah. <laughs> um yeah look i remember as a child i mean i'm very introverted and i'm i'm pretty shy and um you know i i sort of can get quite socially anxious as well so i'm very quite comfortable at, at re recusing myself from large social gatherings and i just remember going to my room and sort of wedging myself in this sort of small corner of the room and just journaling um and when we were in fifth grade my fifth grade teacher gave us a brick of computer paper i don't know if anyone's old enough to remember computer paper with the perforated lines yeah yeah the dot, dots on the side the holes yep so she would give us a brick of it and and sew it together and make it into a book and say to us just keep writing just keep writing and i would just fill these these bricks of computer paper and she would give me another brick Yeah. and another brick and it, it's so therapeutic for me and it's cathartic and meditative and energizing all at the same time and even if i just write for 20 days for 20 minutes on a day it's just a happier day if i've written for Mm. Yeah, 20 minutes yeah. That yeah, that sounds great. Um, and I do certainly remember the the computer paper with the the dots computer and paper. the yeah, and yeah the lines look and I only had the I only had the courage in my late 30s really to give the novel a go you know I'd come to a, a point in my career where I was taking a break we were having our fourth child we'd migrated from uh, London back to Australia to my home in Australia after 10 years in London and you know I say that I'd always wanted to be a writer but I'd always been too afraid to try Yeah. and so I had done a, a creative writing course in London and from that I had created a character and given her I was building a narrative around that character through that creative writing course and when we moved to Australia I had the fourth baby and thought okay listen let me let me try to give it a go and and that was when it's really started for me Mm. And then when you decided that, how hard or easy was it to actually get something published? oh so hard um and and I I think it continues to be hard right like I'm published and I and I get that I have friends emerging authors and writers who who look at that and go that's amazing and I I get it because I look at a book and think that's amazing I even look at my book and think oh my god how did that happen somebody pinched me um but it's just it's constant hard work and to get my first book published in fact my first novel song of the sun god I couldn't get a publisher in Australia Yeah. it's a story of three generations of, of Australian Tamil women and the choices they make to survive Sri Lanka's civil war and they migrate from Sri Lanka to London to Australia and they create a new home here and I was told that it wasn't um that it wasn't Australian enough and that Mm. it Oh, would really? not be able to find a market here um and this was you know this was eight years ago now and I was devastated and grief stricken by that because I'm Australian I was raised here I've lived here this is my home you know I feel so proud when I watch the Indigenous All-Stars or I watch the Olympics you know I I this is my country and this is the, the home that we're raising our children in and so I feel really broken by this idea that my stories were not Australian enough and I eventually found a publisher in Sri Lanka Mm. for Mm. Okay. that first novel Yeah. and then I wrote a second novel and found a publisher here And actually, to be honest, I, at that time, because I knew that my first novel was struggling in the Australian market with that second novel, which was totally different. It was a political thriller set in a dystopic, you know, wasteland in a world destroyed by an Ebola pandemic and a global religious war. Um, I ended up having my protagonist, the name of my protagonist was Zakir Ali. 
a Muslim man, and I ended up changing his name and his color to a white protagonist oh, okay. in order to get the book get published, the book. Oh, in order wow. to make it more palatable yeah. and sellable mm. in the Australian market. And mm. I did get a publisher here. It got published. Mm. And then I wrote another manuscript, which I was not able to find a publisher for. Mm. And then in a staggering display of optimism, um, potentially professional stupidity, I kept writing <laughs> and I wrote Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens. Mm. But by this time, I really felt that my writing career was potentially over and that, you know, I had struggled to publish my third novel. So this was my fourth, Try Time was my fourth. And I thought, well, let me just write with reckless abandon. Mm. Let me write without thinking about a publisher and without thinking about the market. And, you know, my agent's probably going to fire me anyway. <laughs> so why don't I just write like this? Like nobody's reading it. Yeah. And and it was a really liberating experience. Mm. And as a result, I think that I've produced something that's something probably like... more honest and intimate yeah. than anything I've written before. Yeah. And that's really interesting saying that. I think I remember um, another author saying pretty similar to what you've said about writing it for, yeah, not thinking about the readers and that as well, maybe as mm -hmm. much. And yeah. Yeah. Um, Kelly wonders if there's a place in the world that you'd love to have in a future book. A book set in the future? Like, as no, in, in like one of your, another... sorry, one of your future books. It... Uh, so a country, a place? Or... Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Look, I would love to to set a novel in London mm. because that's where I'd spent 10 yes. years of my yeah. life. And it's it's a really vibrant city, and um, and it's a complex city, and it's got lots of different communities, and mm. um, and it's got this incredible colonial history that it's really is actually trying to reckon with, um, but it's also got this tension with Europe, and I think it's just a it's a great place for mm. a for a novel to be set. Mm. It's and a character. Are you writing another novel at the moment? I am, I am, and oh my god, Jackie, I'm really struggling at the moment. I've mm. decided that I'm going to try to wake up early every morning and just write for half an hour. Um, so I'm writing a novel that is. So you remember I mentioned I've written a third novel that yes. didn't get published. Yeah. So my, so what I, I then somewhere along the way, in the middle of writing Try Time at Cinnamon Gardens, I had writer's block, and. I, I got to this point about 50,000 words into to, to Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens where I realized that I was, that every word was a struggle. It just, you know, it was becoming a struggle and I, I felt like I was not in love with my characters and I didn't mm. want to be with them. And mm. that's really problematic mm. if you're writing a novel because you have to breathe the characters, right? They're inside your mind 24-7 yeah. and you've got to love them. You've got to, you've, perhaps you've got to hate them, but you've got to feel strongly about mm. them. And you've got to want to know what they're going to do next. And you either shape it or they just tell you. Mm. But either way, my characters and I were not talking to each other and I was not liking them. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to put this book down, or this manuscript down, and I hate quitting stuff, mm. but I thought, I'll put it down. And I went to Darwin and Catherine for some work with First Nations communities. And I, I sort of, I became totally immersed in, in the, the communities and the landscape. And I ended up writing a short, what's called a short story treatment for a television show. So I essentially wrote a six part TV series set in um in far west you know in a rural community mm. just for the hell of it just to get me started again mm. using ellie Ryder, my character from the unpublished manuscript and then i put that down went back to try time at cinnamon gardens fell back in love with everybody in try time mm. at cinnamon gardens <laughs> finished the novel thank god and and then in the meantime um that particular story for ellie was optioned for television okay so mm. Yeah, so I'm currently working on converting that that project into a TV series mm. with Larissa Berend, um, who's a really respected and beautiful creative. Um, and she's a, a film producer and a director, and she and I are working together on that with Dragon Net Films. And I hope to create both a TV show and a novel from that 
collaboration mm. and that is my next so that's essentially my current project yeah and then and then i'm hoping that i'll get to publish I'll ha that i'll have the opportunity to publish that ellie Ryder story ellie and the prequel which was that third manuscript that had never oh, been okay. published before yeah so we'll see yeah. we'll see fingers crossed that yeah. i'll be able to get both of those out over the next few years mm. sounds like but some really is... exciting things coming yeah. up yeah yeah I hope so. I hope so. But it's, you know, it's busy and life is exhausting and children don't stop eating. And mm. um, so... <laughs> Are you still working as a lawyer? I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm working full time. Mm. And so I Must really have to, to find better everything ways. On. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Sarah's yeah. got a really good question. Um, Sarah said, did you learn more about your own culture as you wrote the book or was it already very familiar to you? And also oh. she wonders if it brought it closer to your grandmother. Oh, such good questions. So I feel like I'm constantly learning. Um, mm. My first novel, Song of the Sun God, was a very detailed exploration of our war and our history. And it was set across 70 years, right? So seven decades mm. of, of that political and social history. So I had to do a lot of learning for that. And with this manuscript, or now novel, I could extract the, the pieces that I needed, but there was still so much. I think you're always learning, right? Mm. So there was still so much. Um, particularly around language and, and the use of history and the way that um, archaeologists, for example, were, were treated and the way they were repressed and the way that they were coerced into trying to tell a different history about their about the country. Um, and so I had to do a lot of research on, on that. And one of the characters is an, in, is an interpreter. Oh, and so okay. really trying yeah. to understand how yeah, people who love Tam the Tamil language mm. um, the different ways in which they will use the Tamil language to express things. So it was a constant, it's always a constant process of learning. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, it, um, you know, anything that makes me or uh, allows me to spend time with my grandmother makes me closer to her. Mm -hmm. But it's been a really hard couple of years, Sarah, because of COVID. Yeah. We have not been able to go into mm -hmm. the nursing home. Mm. And so there have been times when we've seen her in the garden and she's getting older, mm. um, you know, and her mind is not the same. So it has been very hard. And I think in some ways for me, writing um, the book, even though I haven't been able to spend very much time with her over the last mm. two COVID years, mm. writing the book keeps me connected to her because I'm really just reliving a lot of the stories that she's told us. Yeah, um, yeah. And does your yeah. grandmother know that you had this book published? She does not know about this one yeah. because we've told her, but she hasn't. She had a terrible stroke mm. um, about six months ago, oh, okay. so she has not been able to fully understand mm. this one. But Song of the Sun God, she could not stop talking about that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, that was a real, you know, did you know my granddaughter has written yeah. this book and that <laughs> I am a main character. Mm. <laughs> so, yes, she was very, very proud of that first novel. Yeah, yeah. And Jill wonders if you've got a favourite genre to read. And I'm wondering if maybe you've read something lately that you want to recommend to us. Oh, my goodness. Um, I have almost go sort of I read in clusters of genre mm. so I will you know read a whole lot of thrillers in one go and then I'll go back, back to reading um you know uh sort of magic realism or and then I will switch and just read Australian literature mm. and so I can and I almost like to do it in clusters it's like I've, if I want to do something or read something I need to fully immerse myself in it um, and then I'll finally let go and move on to another genre. So at the and then of course I have a book club which I adore because they are also mm. aside from you know very old friends of mine they're also my first readers. So they will be given a manuscript when it's in its ugly form, mm. and they will be there's seven of them, so there's eight of us together, and they will be challenged. They'll be given the job of making my novel better <laughs> um, by mm. by giving me very brutal, very direct, very mm. honest feedback. Um, mm. So it's a real circle of trust with my book club. <laughs> um, but so what? So I have been rereading recently a couple of thrillers because the project that I'm working on is a thriller. So I've been reading or rereading. So I'm rereading The Constant Gardener. Whenever I write a thriller or I'm thinking about a thriller, I will always go back to John McCurry's The Constant Gardener. Yeah. Um, mm. And I go back to I Am Pilgrim by Terry Hayes. Mm. Um, 
I have also been reading some Australian thrillers. So I've been reading um, Canticle Creek by uh, Adrian Highland, um, rereading a little bit of, uh, of Jane Harper and some um, Peter Temple mm. to really kind of deconstruct how. So for me, reading is often like a masterclass. If I'm reading yeah. great literature, it's teaching me how to do better, mm. right? Um, because I'm still learning and I'm still practicing how to do mm. this. And so I'd much rather learn from people that have done that much better than me for a lot longer. Mm. Um, but in terms of recommendations, I recently read The Promise by Damon Galgood. I think I can't remember. I'm not sure if I pronounced his name properly, but it's The Promise. And it was okay. the book that recently won the Booker, the Booker Prize. Um, and I sometimes steer, steer away from Booker Prize winners because they are so intellectual and I don't think I'm yeah. that clever. <laughs> but this one, I, I read it because Book Club recommended it. And mm. I'm too afraid of, of letting my book club down by, by not, not reading the book yeah. because there's a social contract <laughs> between us and you have to read the book. So I read it and it was hard to read. It was very clever. Mm. Um, and so I had to really concentrate because he changes perspective in, within the chapter. So he changes point of view within oh, the really? chapter. Oh, okay. and, and so if any of you are authors out there, writers, you'll know that you're generally encouraged in a scene to stay within one character's head only. Mm. This guy is all over the place. Yeah. So you have to really concentrate to keep up. Yeah, um, and then I also read Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. And that is just exquisite. It's an exquisite exploration of parental grief. And, you know, you, it makes it sound like you wouldn't want to read it because it is it is really sad. Mm -hmm. But she she just delivers it so beautifully. And it's it's actually makes it makes Shakespeare's wife the focal point. So it's about Shakespeare and his wife and child oh, who died. Okay. Yeah. And you know that from the outset. From the very first page, you know it. And the child is called Hamnet, on whom Hamlet, Hamlet. was based. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And it just, just to, to see that relationship um, and to see Shakespeare through the eyes of his wife mm -hmm. and to centre a woman and a woman's story and a woman's grief, it was beautifully done and mm -hmm. very, very readable. It was very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for the for the chronically fatigued like myself um, and poor of concentration. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, thanks for those recommendations. We always love getting recommendations. Me too. I keep an yeah. ongoing list. Yeah, I'm like that too, yeah. Kelly um, wonders if there's an author who's inspired your writing journey. Uh, so there are a few who have uh, inspired my writing mm. journey. I think I have a real, um, I have a real love for South Asian writers, as you can imagine. Um, and so Camilla Shumsey, who wrote Home Fire, um, she really, it, it's such a beautifully constructed and powerfully told novel that is a very short. So she gets in and she mm. gets out, but mm. she hits you hard in the meantime. Mm. So Camilla Shumsey, um, Melina Marquetta and Looking for Ali Brandy, when I was young, um, you know, we had to read this novel in school and then my brother had to read the novel in school. Okay. But of course, my brother refused to read it. So my mother made me read it again oh. and she made me, don't tell the education board, but she made me basically write his essays for oh, him really? on okay. looking for Ali Brandy. <laughs> and I loved it so much. I was only too happy to write my essays and then write his essays. Yeah. Um, and looking for Ali Brandy, anything by Melina Marquesa, but looking for Ali Brandy was a real watershed moment for me in Australian mm. literature because it is about this Italian family, um, you know, who are who are not white and who grapple with their own place in Australia and the the suffocation of that community, but also the richness of that community. Mm. And I remember reading it and thinking, I totally get you. I am not Italian, but I get this and yeah. you get me. Yeah. Um, and so she was inspirational for me and has really um, just gave me such courage to keep going. Mm. And then, of course, Arundhati Roy and Jhumpa Lahiri, um, two South Asian writers, again, who just tell simple stories so beautifully. And I, and I think I, I really gravitate towards authors who can use language beautifully but also very simply mm. you know it, i think good writing is very much about the your power of observation your attentiveness to those beautiful details and to the the brutal details and then approaching all of that with with humility and curiosity and respect mm. and wanting 
to essentially just provide it a space to exist in. Mm. Um, and so you're not trying to do anything fancy. You're not even trying to do anything at all. You're just trying to honor what you're seeing and feeling and thinking. And Jhumpa Lahiri and Arundhati Roy both, in Arundhati Roy's first book, The God of Small Things, and Jhumpa Lahiri, anything she wrote, mm. um, are authors that have really given me such... Um, such strength and encouragement yeah yeah no they sound all great inspirations mm. and um if you want to can i, can I give you one more yeah, just because australian sure. literature i feel like i need to um <laughs> australian literature i mean in anything by that comes out of sweatshop the western sydney literacy movement anything mm. by michael muhammad ahmed um there's some new authors coming through. Christine Shamista. I just read a manuscript. So one of the joys of being an author is I get manuscripts now. Yeah, as well. to re- yeah. Mm. And and I just read a young adult fiction novel. Okay, young adult mm. fiction, um, called Ashani, but entirely written in verse. So oh, it's really? about it's a young girl's identity, her her struggles with her identity in Australia. But it's a narrative form, but entirely in poetry. Oh, really? And wow. she just delivers yeah. a story through poetry. Mm. It's amazing. So it's Ashani by Christine Shamista. Mm. Um, yeah. So get your hands on some Australian yeah. literature. No, thanks for that. <laughs> and Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens has some really wonderful characters. Um, just wondering if you could be one of the characters in your book for a day, <laughs> who would you choose to be and why? Oh, I would totally be Maya. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, of course, right? Because she she is this um, incredibly strong mm. woman who hasn't lost her sense of humor mm. or um, her capacity for even for, for sort of self mockery. She is she she lives with strength and humor and generosity, mm. and she writes. She gets to write every single day. Yeah. And and um, I don't, I don't want to tell you any story spoilers about who she is and what mm. she does. Mm. But she has found a way, despite the constraints of the the country that she lives in and the role that she's thrust into, because her husband suffers from PTSD, and he's incredibly traumatized by events that happened to him in Sri Lanka. Mm. And so she really has to step up when they migrate to Australia with their young family. Yeah. And it's she who leads the nursing home and transforms it into this community as a way of building a community around her family and around her husband mm. to you know, in restoring the nursing home she's trying to restore him mm. and she really values the stories of the people around her and so i identify with her because i love the stories of the people around me yeah. um, and i love that she gets to do what i would love to do for the rest of my life which is right yeah yeah and chanel um wonders what your favorite book was to read when you were younger uh, to kill a mocking bed, yeah, without a doubt. Mm. So, so a lot of my childhood was spent with my best friend Kate Kelly, who always gets a name check in my novels. So, when you <laughs> read any novel by me, there will always be a Kate Kelly in there somewhere. Okay. Um, and and so Kate Kelly and I were super nerdy and would spend a lot of time in the library. And Kate Kelly introduced me to books about dragons. And so a lot of my childhood was spent reading fantasy novels, mm. right? But To Kill a Mockingbird really changed how I saw storytelling, how I saw being a lawyer. It made mm. me want to be a lawyer, mm. made me want to work in the justice field, um, made me feel that what people did mattered um, and that courage, that it was important to have courage and it was important to have empathy and that telling a story or being a lawyer were two very important and powerful ways in which you could create social change and yeah. protect marginalised people. Mm. And so that book really influenced me both as a writer and, and as a lawyer. Mm. And Jill wonders if you pay much attention to your reviews. Oh, Jill. <laughs> Have you been reading my reviews, Jill? Mm. Um, so I so this is really the first, um, you know, Song of the Sun God was really widely and beautifully reviewed in South Asia, right? It it was never published in Australia. Mm. The barrier was briefly, you know, it had a sort of five minutes of fame. um, And so it was reviewed and quite well. 
Chai Time at Cinnamon Gardens. Now, Ultimo Press, who publishes it, have this great team and they're, they're just so um, empowering for their authors, right? They really support them and try to get them out there. Mm. And um, and also in a way that's comfortable and comforting and fun for, you know, we socially introverted author types <laughs> that are terrified of talking to people. And so, so it has had a lot of, of press so far. And for the most part, it has been really warmly and very generously and very powerfully reviewed. Mm. Um, so it was in The Australian, it was in The Canberra Times, um, The AU Review, a bunch of places. And then recently, it got a review where the byline was was actually really hard, like it was hard to take. Um, and I, like, I'll be completely honest with you, right? Because I don't know how to not, how not to be honest. Um, the byline was really it, it hurt, and I was oh, like, really? okay, mm. yeah. So okay, so this person thinks that, and they're entitled to mm. think that, and of course they should think whatever they want to think. Mm. And and you know, no one, uh, no one, you know, no one book lands positively with every person. Um, you know, my book club, there's eight of us, and the best books that we read and review together are the ones that have polarised us. Yeah. The, the conversations and mm. the fights that my book club has mm. that are the best <laughs> are about the books that we disagree on. Yeah. I have been known to leave other social engagements to come back for book club to defend a book because I felt so <laughs> strongly about it. Yeah. So I read this review and I was like, okay, it's really useful for me to see it and to learn from it. Um, and I, so in answer to your question, I absolutely read it and I read it three times. Mm. Um, and then my dad called me and said, stop reading it. <laughs> um, and, but it was good for me to read it and mm. it's good for me to see what other people think. Mm. Um, and it's definitely not a book that is for everyone, right? Because it's, it does challenge you and it yeah. does ask us to think about race in Australia mm. and therefore to think about racism in mm. Australia. Um, and so in answer to your question, I do read them all. Um, and then I, on my family WhatsApp group, I just send the good ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like 50 cousins around the world that only get good press. <laughs> and what about, um, reader feedback? Because like there are a lot of traumatic things in the book. Has, have you found that people have read it and it's brought back things that have happened in their life? Yeah, that's a really good question, mm. Jackie. Um, I get that a lot, particularly mm. from people who come from countries that have that have struggled with war. Mm. And the thing that they um, and I worry about this, right? Like I've wondered with not with my work, should it have should it come with a with a with a trauma disturbing content mm. warning, right? And like, and I don't want to put readers off. Um, I, I don't want you to think that it, it's so traumatic that you can't read it or that you mustn't read it because I think it's important to sit in the stories of other people mm. um, so that we understand their lived experience and we understand, for example, why it is that some people are forced to leave their countries mm. and why they long for that homeland um, and how in incredible it is that we embrace them or how important it is that we embrace them and try to enable them to have build a life here. And if you don't know where they've come from, you don't know why they're here. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the the most so the the most pervasive and consistent feedback I get is that people say to me that um, they felt it was really important that I wrote the things that I wrote because it, it enabled those stories to be out there in the world. And a lot mm. of what I write are stories that, for example, in Sri Lanka, are suppressed by the mm. government. Yeah. Um, and it isn't a safe space to discuss these mm. things, right? Journalists and, and political activists and lawyers are, are, are shot and killed mm. for telling these stories. And these injustices are not adjudicated. They're not taken to court. Mm. Um, you know, police and the soldiers and the government, they will never be um, brought to justice for what was done to people. And so using, so fiction for me is a really important way of exploring mm. those truths. Mm. And so people have been incredibly, um, I guess, welcoming almost about it to say that they're grateful that, it, that I've um, taken the time to write it and to write it as authentically um, and as honestly and as respectfully and sensitively as I have tried to write yeah. it. And you know, it, it isn't my lived experience. And as a lawyer, I work with a lot of, of vulnerable clients mm. and we work with them to enable their lived experience to be um, used to make sure that laws are protecting them in the way that they are supposed to protect them. Yeah. Right? So if yeah. a law is failing, if a law is failing, you only understand that 
when you talk to the person the lawyer is supposed to be helping. Mm -hmm. And so I have a lot of experience in working with people who've been through trauma and understanding and talking about lived experience. And it's mm -hmm. it has to just be done so carefully. And I hope and I pray um, and I hope that I've done it the right way. Mm -hmm. And Sarah's asked a question that I was thinking after what you've just said now. Um, are the books, like, could... Could they be sent to Sri Lanka or would they be banned in Sri Lanka? Look, I mean, with the current government right now, um, mm. I wouldn't even, uh, you know, my auntie went to Sri Lanka recently and, you know, she asked me, she would, you know, would you like me to take some books? And I was like, mm. mm. yeah. and you don't want to go through mm. the airport and have your suitcase opened. Yeah. But, you know, I am, I, I am a nobody, right? I am not a politician. Mm. I am not a journalist or an activist. I am absolutely a nobody. Mm. I think I just wouldn't want to take that risk for other people. Yeah. Um, um, but there's definitely a culture of censorship and surveillance in Sri Lanka. Mm. And so I would be careful myself. Um, and certainly when I've gone to Sri Lanka for research, I am careful. Um, and my parents are very worried until I come home. Mm. And I do always let the Australian High Commission know that I'm there. Mm. Mm. So, you know. Yeah, no, very interesting. But, but, and like I said, it made me aware of a lot of things that probably I hadn't been before. So, mm. Yeah, yeah, look, there are some very brave people in the world who who live in Sri Lanka and still try to advocate on mm. these issues and they do so at great risk to their lives. And, you know, I write from the comfort and the privilege of being an Australian yeah. Sri Lankan Tamil yeah. whose parents left before the war started and so our lives mm. were not destroyed. Mm. And we have had the refuge and the benefit of this wonderful country. And so I write with all of that privilege in mind um, and I write with a sense of responsibility that mm. that privilege gives me mm. for the people that my family left behind. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for talking to me. Been really, really interesting. And um, so like welcome. I said, your book, loved your book. And that was really interesting as well. And hope everyone goes out and buys your book. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you and for these fabulous questions. Mm. I really enjoyed them. And, you know, I would love to hear you ask me about reader feedback. I would love to have reader feedback from you. So you can find me on Instagram and social media jackie will let you know how to find me um and i would love to know what you think yeah because um, the book is about I, I really want the book to be a conversation starter mm. um you know where we can talk respectfully and meaningfully about what it means to be australian and and how lucky we all are yeah 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 well thanks so much and thanks to everyone we did have some really great questions thanks superb thanks, thanks. bye everybody